we'll discuss tax incentives for affordable housing and home ownership. Please welcome moderator Buzz Roberts, President and CEO of the National Association of Affordable Housing Lenders, a National Alliance of Leading Banks, Community Development Financial Institutions, CDFIs, and other capital providers for affordable housing and inclusive neighborhood revitalization. Buzz was formerly the Director of the Office of Small Business, Community Development, and Housing Policy at the U.S. Treasury Department. Buzz is joined by panelist Christopher Coes. Vice President of Land Use and Development at Smart Growth America. Christopher oversees real estate programs including LOCUS, Responsible Real Estate Developers and Investors. Christopher launched the Attainable Housing and Social Equity Initiative, which assists local communities in developing strategies aimed at encouraging economic growth while ensuring accessibility and social equity. Julia Gordon, President of the National Community Stabilization Trust, NCST, a nonprofit organization that seeks to reclaim vacant homes to build strong neighborhoods. Julia is well known in the mortgage, affordable housing, and community development sectors for her commitment to supporting vibrant neighborhoods and advancing sustainable home ownership. Stockton Williams, Executive Director of the National Council of State Housing Finance Agencies, whose members have delivered nearly $500 billion in financing to make possible the purchase, development, and rehabilitation of more than 7 million affordable homes for low and moderate income households. Stockton has 25 years of experience in housing development, finance, policy, research, and advocacy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've got a great panel here to talk about um, tax policy and uh, affordable housing and home ownership. Tax policy just clears a room. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on what room it is. Yeah. I, uh, but um, uh, you've all uh, already been introduced uh, to Stockton, Julia, and Christopher. We're going to start with Stockton. Um, so Stockton, uh, low-income housing tax credit legislation seems to be making some progress on the Hill. We've got bills introduced in both the House and Senate. They're both building support on a bipartisan basis. Uh, what would these bills do? Well, thanks, Buzz. And, and the first thing I want to say is uh, how glad I am to be here. I really appreciate uh, Vince Malta and Shannon McGann and Joe Ventrone and everyone on the policy and advocacy team at the National Association of Realtors uh, utilizing this forum this year to focus on housing affordability. I think everybody knows that when NAR's members uh, get organized and focused on, on a policy issue, things in Washington happen. So uh, re really glad to be here and, and commend NAR for the affordability focus. Uh, Buzz mentioned a program called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Uh, show of hands if this is familiar to you, if, you're, if you know a little bit about this. Uh, this is a tax incentive uh, that enables uh, the development, the rehab of affordable rental apartments. We're talking a little rental housing here. Uh, Ed Golding on the last panel said there are a lot of renters who pay more than half their income for rent. It, it's a lot. It's more than 11 million, as a matter of fact, if you can believe that, paying more than half of their income for rent. And so the, the housing credit, as we call it, is a really important incentive to try to produce at least some of the affordable apartments that working folks who are aspiring and, and saving to become homeowners uh, one day can actually afford. Uh, Buzz, you mentioned some legislation that's pending. Uh, many of the housing uh, organizations in Washington are uh, working together to get the housing credit program expanded and improved, and uh, can give you some details on that. Uh, through bipartisan legislation called the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. Now, this is a bill in the House and Senate. It's got terrific Republican and Democrat lead sponsors in both chamber, and it is piling up the co-sponsors. More than 200 House members have signed on to the House version, and 38 senators so far uh, have signed on to the Senate version. And all the way down the line, however you want to slice it, uh, the support for this legislation and this housing credit program is bipartisan. So I'll give you the latest uh, little, little slice I did uh, just this morning. Three uh, of the seven House impeachment managers 
are co-sponsors of the bill, as are three of the eight House members that President Trump appointed to his defense team. So there you go on the most partisan, <laughs> polarizing issues. It, this program crosses party lines, and it's no joke. Uh, it's one of the big reasons why, as we can talk about as we go forward, we think there's a good chance to at least get some of this legislation enacted this year. And tell us the essence of what these bills would do, that low-income housing credit has been around since 1986, so it's well established. Why are changes uh, necessary? Why all the fuss about this legislation? It's a great question. Um, the main thing that the bill does is provide more housing credit. So the way the housing credit uh, works, it's uh, run at the state level. Uh, it's designed to meet state and, and community level housing needs. Uh, and probably the biggest uh, criticism you could make uh, of the housing credit program these days is there aren't enough housing credits to go around. So the Housing Credit Improvement Act uh, would increase the base amount of credits by 50% uh, and do a bunch of other things to effectively add even more to the supply of housing credits at the state level. In particular, uh, make housing credit apartments more feasible in rural areas for very low income people, for the preservation of existing apartments where low income people uh, need to live. It would make a bunch of other uh, streamlining kinds of technical changes too that we could get into. Um, but the real headline is this bill would provide the states more housing credits to get more affordable housing built and preserved. Well, let's uh, shift gears a little bit to home ownership. Uh, your membership, the housing finance agencies, use a variety of tax incentives for home ownership. Um, what are some of those and what's, what's new, what's going on with those? Yeah, so the state housing finance agencies really began in the 60s and, and 70s uh, focused on using uh, tax exempt bonds uh, that they can issue uh, to produce uh, lower interest rate mortgages for both uh, affordable apartment construction, often in conjunction with the housing credit that we've been talking about, and also for home ownership. And so for all the, the realtors who work with state housing uh, finance agencies around the country, you know that uh, tax exempt housing bonds for uh, affordable first time home ownership are an incredibly important tool. Give you a sense of it, uh, last year the state housing finance agencies issued about $8 billion in tax exempt bonds for home ownership, helped about 60,000 folks with an average income of around $50,000 become homeowners, first time homeowners. So it's an incredibly important uh, tool, uh, somewhat like the low-income housing tax credit, um, uh, happily, uh, tax exempt housing bonds have, have existed, been part of the tax code for quite some time. Uh, so every once in a while, it's uh, important to go back through all the statutory language and, and regulations and try to see where we could improve. And so we're working on a, a bill now with a leading member of the US Senate uh, to make some really important changes uh, to the mortgage revenue bond program, uh, increasing the amount of bond authority states could use for affordable home ownership, allowing these bonds to support refinances as well as uh, new purchases, getting rid of a home improvement loan limit that's been set in statute at $15,000. You can't do much home improvement for that. These kinds of sort of common sense changes that we think will go a long way to helping state HFAs and realtors and others create more affordable home ownership opportunity with tax exempt housing bonds. So it seems that over the last two or three years, there's been a greater utilization of uh, housing bonds, and for that matter, the broader tax exempt bond class called private activity bonds, of which home ownership bonds and rental housing bonds are, are uh, a part. What, what's going on? Why are is the utilization going up, and what do you see in the future for that? Right, so uh, tax exempt housing bonds, which uh, uh, state housing finance agencies and local housing agencies issue are uh, one of a, a category of, of municipal bonds that are all uh, subject to an annual volume limit uh, in each state, a volume limit that's uh, put in place in federal law. And uh, coming out of the uh, uh, financial crash and, and Great Recession, and, and during this period when interest rates have generally been quite low, um, a lot of states haven't needed as much uh, tax exempt bond authority to do some of the things that um, are eligible um, uh, besides housing. Well, we know there's huge housing needs, so in states across the country, 75, 80, 90 percent of this category of municipal bonds, private activity bonds, as you describe them, Buzz, uh, 
is going to housing, both affordable rental housing and first-time home ownership. We see more and more demand for these bonds, this form of low-cost financing that they uh, generate. For years, it's just been some of the higher cost, bigger coastal states that have kind of been saying, we're tight, we, we don't have enough bond authority to meet our housing needs. But now we're seeing more states in the Southeast and throughout the Sun Belt express the same desire for more bond cap authority. So I think over the next few years, this problem will get more acute. Uh, some of what's going on at FHFA regarding uh, the future of Fannie and Freddie might further exacerbate this. We can save that till the end of our conversation after my colleagues have jumped in. Um, but bottom line is that we see uh, growing demand for tax exempt housing bond authority for both rental and home ownership housing in more and more states around the country. Great. Uh, Julia, Christopher, anything to add to this so far? We can. Well, then we'll just move right along to you, Julia. You, you've been one of the leaders in an effort to create a new tax credit under the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. Tell us what that is. Sure, thanks. And also, before I start, I also want to thank NAR for having us here today. This is such an important conversation. And uh, what I see today is a lot of creativity out there right now, as well as some uh, big and very, very wide coalitions working together. And, you know, sometimes I think there's an inverse relationship between how much Congress is getting done versus how much we're trying to get done outside there. So, you know, thanks to um, everyone at the Realtors for being such a great partner on, on so many projects right now. And, uh, you know, to, to really pick up where Stockton left off, you know, the housing problems in this country go far beyond the well-publicized issues of um, displacement of low-income renters in the very high-cost coastal cities. Um, the fact is, across most of the country, the most common form of neighborhood change right now isn't gentrification, it's decline. Um, and part of that has to do with the fact that um, more than 40% of our housing stock right now is more than 50 years old. Um, you know, we still have elevated vacancy rates post uh, foreclosure crisis across a number of neighborhoods. Um, and some, around six million homes that at one point were owner occupied before the crisis have shifted uh, seemingly somewhat permanently over to rental. Um, so as we've discussed on several other panels, there is a supply an inventory problem, particularly in the starter home area in those lower value bands. Um, you know, where are those homes? Those homes are in the neighborhoods where people live uh, all across the middle of the country. Um, these are uh, often historically black home ownership neighborhoods. Um, they are neighborhoods that are viable, but neighborhoods that require some investment in, in, under the theory that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, you know, we, at NCST, we just see it so important to ensure that neighborhoods that may be struggling don't decline and become, you know, one of those areas of concentrated disadvantage that it's just so hard to ever get your way out of. But in many of these areas the problem is it costs more to build or renovate a home than you can sell it for right because the housing market is stuck the housing market is, is broken there and needs some help to get back on its feet and that's where this idea comes from the neighborhood homes investment uh, act would create a gap filling tax credit to help bring private investment into those areas to um, you know, renovate an existing structure or build structure on, you know, existing land. Um, this tends to be very, uh, you know, very much focused in areas where first time home buyers would be able to afford a home um, and where you need this kind of investment in improving the housing stock. So um, to talk a little bit about the mechanics of how this bill works, 
Um, essentially, it's very similar to the low income housing tax credit, except for single family. And by single family, which is one of those terms that everybody understands differently, we're talking about one to four units, including condos. So we're not, we're not saying single family as in a structure that only one family can live in, but as opposed to the large rental units that you see. Um, so for investors interested in projects that would develop areas with that kind of stock, um, the developer, uh, this is something that would flow through the states just like LIHTC does. Um, there would be an allocation plan just like there is under LIHTC. A developer would come in with a proposal to do a certain number of homes in a certain neighborhood because the best way to help a neighborhood is to really concentrate your efforts and you know, get everything up to speed. Um, eligible for this activity would be um, existing homes that are vacant and would get renovated and sold, but also eligible are um, new construction in those areas, as well as working with existing homeowners to help them with the deferred maintenance issue that we see in so many of these neighborhoods. And that last piece is incredibly important for making sure this is not a tool of displacement, but a tool of really bringing the standard up of the neighborhood for everybody. And so you go in, you do your, your work, you sell the home to a homeowner, and whatever the gap was between the costs of doing your project and what you're able to sell that home for in the market, that gap would be filled by this tax credit so that the investors are not taking the risk of this so-called valuation gap um, when they come into this project. And we think it's a great way to push this idea of this public-private partnership into home ownership and into the more distressed areas that really need it. Are we just talking about uh, big cities or would this also work in rural communities, uh, some uh, inner ring suburbs? Uh, what's the vision here? Um, it would work in all of those places. What we have in the bill is certain parameters for eligible census tracts. And these are parameters having to do with the area median income, the home values in the area, et cetera. And the way we've calibrated it in the bill, it would cover um, probably close to a quarter of, uh, of neighborhoods in the cities and maybe even a little more in rural areas. Great, and, um, but why do we need yet another tax incentive? Stockton just talked a little bit about tax exempt bonds for home ownership. Why do we need a different, another tool in our toolbox here? So you really need two things for home ownership. You need the family that can buy the home and you need the home for the family to buy. And so what we're doing is solving the second part of that problem while Stockton solves the first part. And um, where does this stand on the hill? Um, we're very excited about where this stands on the hill. It was introduced several months ago in the house by Representative uh, Higgins from Buffalo and Kelly from Erie, Pennsylvania, um, uh, one Democrat, one Republican. Since then, we've picked up, I think, about nine more uh, co-sponsors, again, trying to do this in a very bipartisan way, trying to you know, bring folks on from both sides of the aisle. We are hopeful that in the next week, we will see introduction in the Senate. Keep your fingers crossed for us. Um, you know, we have been talking to Senators Cardin and Portman. Um, a ver this is not a new idea. A version of this bill um, was introduced back in 2003 during the Bush administration when there were upwards of 300 bipartisan co-sponsors. So we see, uh, we don't, we don't, we, we can't imagine why this would be a partisan issue. Members from both sides of the aisle have this exact problem in their districts and we're, we're hopeful for support. We're pretty excited that uh, next week when Habitat for Humanity comes in for their lobby day, that this is gonna be um, one of their focus areas. And we have, uh, created an extremely um, broad coalition, uh, you know, ranging from NAR and Buzz's organization and Stockton's organization, 
to the mortgage bankers, to Habitat, uh, to, you know, Liz. The realtors. I, I said them first. <laughs> I know where I'm sitting. Um, so uh, for anyone who, who is from another group here that isn't in this coalition yet, see me after. Um, well, so maybe both you and Stockton and, and Christopher, too, if you want, can get in on this. Uh, doesn't this set up some kind of competition between the low income housing tax credit and this new proposal for neighborhood homes? So we don't see it as a competition. We see these as very complementary. They're aimed at different parts of the housing market. Um, we're aimed, you know, the, the neighborhood homes bill is aimed at home ownership um, and it's aimed at increasing the quality of the housing stock that we have out there, which is uh, you know, not only a good idea from a supply, demand, affordability perspective, but also from a sustainability and you know, um, being, being uh, 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 mindful of our resources perspective. Um, and really, it's, it's just very complementary. It uses a lot of the same structures. It uses the housing finance agencies. It just provides another tool in the toolbox so that states can try to meet a broader range of needs when they're looking at the affordable housing issue. I totally agree. I would just add a couple of things. Um, you know, in terms of the, the political support, I think what we're seeing in, in the coalition that you two are, are really leading is seeing is that uh, some of the members of Congress in both parties who have been supporters of more affordable rental housing through the low-income housing tax credit are some of the ones who are most interested, kind of first to go in or express interest in potentially being the lead sponsor of the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. So I think, you know, we've, we've built a lot of awareness and frankly, um, uh, the affordability challenges that the country has um, are a lot more widely known um, than they were, say, five, six years ago. Um, and then I think in terms of competition for, you know, the equity capital that ultimately will drive uh, both the, the housing credit and the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, um, and understanding that there are potential changes to the Community Reinvestment Act, but, which, Buzz, you probably know as much, if not more, about than anybody, um, we really believe that, that there are, uh, is lots of uh, demand, both existing and, and, uh, and, and pent up, for uh, well-structured tax incentives that can uh, deliver a meaningful economic return and also do a very tangible good thing in communities all around the country. So uh, the question of competition uh, at any level is always important to ask, but we really don't see it as being problematic in any way for the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. I just want to add to the fact that I do a lot of work on Capitol Hill, and I would say, having seen both of these proposals, the more we can get members talking about housing affordability, the better, and whatever avenues and tools actually creates the groundswell support we need, not just in terms of a specific policy, but the fact that as a federal government, we need to be more proactive in terms of delivering resources. So I know we are working on a number of proposals around affordable housing. I think the more of our ecosystem beyond just a traditional affordable housing advocates can be talking on Capitol Hill about affordable housing <laughs> is a good thing. Well, Christopher, uh, probably the newest and shiniest <laughs> Uh, tax incentive out there today are, of course, opportunity zones. Yes. And some of the big press coverage is, has been around uh, things like uh, uh, luxury housing or office buildings, sure. not things we necessarily associate with affordable housing. But is there an affordable housing angle on opportunity zones? Is this a tool that can be used? For um, affordable housing. I'm going to um, repeat uh, my other colleagues. I just want to first say thank you to uh, the National Association of Realtors uh, for inviting me again. Um, we've been a part of this conversation uh, for a long time. Smart Group America has been a long time strategic partner with the realtors on a number of issues. And when it comes to opportunity zones, um, I know I saw my uh, dear friend uh, Bob Turner, who I believe we've probably now done at least six or seven. Uh, road shows together about housing affordability as it relates to affordable housing. And each time we revisit these communities, I'll tell you this, uh, despite what you're seeing in the headlines of newspapers, um, 
housing affordability, but particularly mixed income housing, is by far one of the number one products that people are looking to invest in. Uh, most recently, uh, Novogradic and uh, the National uh, 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 Council on uh, Housing Finance Agencies uh, keep a running track of opportunity funds across the country. And as of 115, funds have been designated to actually look for more workforce, mid six home, and affordable housing. And even just to think about that in terms of scale, uh, the, ter the total amount of capital. Now, before I even jump in, how many people are, act are aware of Opportunity Zones? Okay, for those who did not sh uh, raise your hand, here's a quick 101. If you have unrealized capital gains, whether it's in land holding or in a building, the federal government basically says, Right now, we have an analyzed, there's about $6 trillion of unrealized capital gains sitting in Wall Street, sitting in uh, Silicon Valley. How do we get those dollars in middle of America, right? If you have those unrealized capital gains and you sell that asset and invest it in a property or in a business and keep it there for 10 years, and of course, I know I'm in a room full of realtors, you like to understand appreciation, right? If your uh, asset appreciates after 10 years, any increment of that, um, would be uh, tax-free, federal, at the federal level. So your income, your capital gains that you earn after 10 years on that product is now tax-free at the federal level. It's a huge incentive. So you have right now, out of 115 opportunity funds that have been created, about 9 billion of those are dedicated to affordable housing, mixed income, multifamily units. In terms of scale, on an annual basis, the low-income housing tax credit is roughly seven to nine billion dollars. So roughly in less than 12 months that this is sent to after the regs have now come out recently, you see a lot of excitement. Now here's the honest truth. Traditionally, uh, when it comes to traditional affordable housing, specifically D restrictor or rent restrictor, 60%, we know that in order to create those housing products, you need subsidy, right? Well, Opportunity Zones, in terms of the first wave of projects that we're seeing, is really mixed income workforce. It's easier to pencil, it's easier to deliver. However, increasingly, we are beginning to find a number of elected uh, local communities. I'm right now working in 13 cities across the country who are adopting direct Opportunity Zone incentives, particularly for affordable housing, to actually close those gaps. So right now there's a project uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts, where the local community actually designated urban um, affordable housing TIF to actually now partner those dollars with any new opportunity fund that is doing affordable housing. So in many ways, when I look at opportunity zones and as it relates to housing affordability, it's the entire income system. Now the first wave, the easiest is the mixed income aspect. If you want to go deeper in terms of deep affordability, it really requires the locality, the state, and what is really fascinating about Opportunity Zones is bringing together new stakeholders, philanthropy, hospitals, and the like who have their own capital, who also see affordable housing as a key strategy in their neighborhood to the table to actually finance. So if you are a developer now, you should go beyond just your traditional housing finance uh, ecosystems and actually look at your employers, your hospitals to potentially do those deals. And in many ways, this is the first time we're beginning to see a national program, a federal program like this, that is bringing different stakeholders to the table about how do we truly transform our communities, provide housing for all residents of all income streams. So it's really exciting. And I think the thing I am actually more mindful of is ignore the headlines. Because if you read New York Times, you'll get one picture. But if you now actually, and I did it before coming here, if you Google affordable housing opportunity zone in your selected cities, you're seeing a ton of ribbon cuttings happening at the local level in the local newspapers. So um, right now, Opportunity Zones, if we're really going to make it uh, achieve the outcome that we want, the private sector has to take a lead. And more importantly, now is the time for us to have a radical reimagination of actually how we produce mixed income and affordable housing in Opportunity Zones. And so um, you talk about new investors coming to the table. Are city and state governments coming to the table with real resources here to make some of these housing uh, concepts actually work and give us an example or two of I would give that. so in that low uh, example in Lowell Massachusetts um, mm -hmm. what I what we're increasingly finding with a lot of our state partners and even local partners is not even creating new resources actually redirecting and reprioritizing existing resources to these opportunity zones so in the case of the um, Massachusetts example the state actually took existing housing dollars 
they used uh, existing uh, energy dollars because they were actually, as part of the affordable housing unit, they were actually putting uh, energy efficiency as well as other uh, green energy into the building. So they were able to tap into some of their uh, energy funds that they have. Um, in addition to that, the local government, as I pointed out, created a t uh, housing TIF district, which was the first of its kind in the state. Secondly, they're using their CDBG dollars for the project. And it's also being helped finance using uh, Section 8. That's one example. The second example um, that we're seeing is most recently the administration has been uh, making major tweaks to existing HUD affordable housing programs as well as the low-income housing tax credit with the 4%, where we now see there is an accelerator uh, where now if you have a low-income housing tax credit deal that's in an opportunity zone, HUD and the, uh, a lot of the agencies are saying, we will fast track your application. In addition to that, for Section 8 and uh, the 221D4 program, which is a, another multifamily affordable housing program that's done by HUD, they're also providing additional bonuses and incentives. So in many ways, the existing pots of money that are out there are actually being reprioritized to opportunity zones. So again, from my perspective, it's not only what new dollars are coming, are we using the existing dollars that we have smarter? So it's another layer in the layer case. Exactly right. Well, said, could I just add a quick yeah. comment on that? Yeah. Uh, because um, I, I agree with a lot of what Christopher said. I appreciate his work with local communities to try to make opportunity zones effective. And um, if you're looking at the press coverage, whether it's negative or, or positive, it tends to almost always focus on the actual transaction, the right. mixed income development or the small business or whatever it is that's directly benefiting from the tax incentive uh, that, was, that was passed by Congress. But the opportunity zone is an area, yeah. it's a neighborhood. It might be several neighborhoods. And this is frankly why my members, state housing finance agencies care, and it's why I think realtors should care. Mm -hmm. There are thousands and thousands of jurisdictions around the country uh, that have been designated by their governors as opportunity zones. And what's going to happen in those zones will be affected, uh, may be driven in some cases by projects that directly uh, tap into this federal tax incentive. But if the program works as its fathers and mothers in Congress, Senator Tim <laughs> Scott and others envision, it will spur a broader set of activity. State housing finance agencies, private investors, small business owners will all be putting their resources to work to try to strengthen these areas, these zones. So I would just encourage those of you who may think, well, geez, I don't really participate in commercial real estate, to not think solely about the Opportunity Zone transaction or project and think about the Opportunity Zone as a place. And I, just as a follow-up, I, I don't know if anyone here is from Chicago. Uh, anyone? I see a couple of hands. Um, they just recently, uh, last year, late last year, actually convened uh, a lot of their local leadership, local aldermen, to actually brief them on, here's your, because first of all, one of the things we were realizing is that a lot of local officials are re recognizing that they actually have an opportunity zone. Right? And secondly, uh, what I found very fascinating, I think is recordable to a lot of the work that we're doing nationwide, is that in this conversation, the fact that the realtors actually had local data of how do we actually produce affordable housing, mixed income development projects here, what does that mean for the local zoning laws, right? We can't talk about affordable housing just in the project. We have to understand that the local government and the realtors had the ability to do that in a way that they actually understood and they can trust. So I think to, to Stockman's point, it's more than just a transaction. The idea now, one of the things that we did as early on in the Opportunity Zones, recognizing that when we looked at housing affordability, we found that the average resident living in these zones across the country were spending approximately 52% of their household income on housing and transportation, right? And so if you're gonna have any housing affordability conversation, it's not just about the building, but it's about the place. How do you make that place more accessible? And really right now, that's where I think a lot of the conversation is residing at those tables. And I think uh, that's an exciting um, place for us to be. Well, I mean, I just want to underscore what, what both Stockton and Chris have said about neighborhoods, um, you know, and, and not just saying this because our name is the National Community <laughs> Stabilization Trust, but th this, is a, this is not a problem of just individual either renters or home buyers out there. Um, you know, you need a variety of tools. Um, you know, one of the things that spurred on the work of this coalition about the Neighborhoods Home Bill is the opportunity, we were excited by the idea of opportunity zones, but the way it's structured, it sort of works better with rental projects. 
um, or you know, projects that have a 10-year horizon, and that's not how the home ownership works. So this is almost like another piece, and what we're doing is bringing all these pieces to the table. I, two days ago, I spent the entire day driving through neighborhoods in Baltimore. Um, and what I was driving through in Baltimore was what, uh, there's an organization in Baltimore called Healthy Neighborhoods. I was driving through those healthy neighborhoods, probably drive, drove through about 20 of them, spent a lot of time in the car. Um, but what I saw around me is, you know, you're not just seeing, you know, yes, there's a LIHTC project here, and yes, there's a block of row homes that we renovated over here. But what you're seeing is the concentration of bringing in the new school building and the new commercial strip and fixing up this and maybe you get the funeral home to move a little <laughs> over a little bit. Um, and and we've, I, I feel like for a few decades we've sort of lost this community and neighborhood focus mm -hmm. and I'm starting to see it come back across the board and that's really exciting. That's great. So let's um, change subjects and sort of have a free for all conversation. <laughs> Uh, around uh, home ownership policy uh, on the tax side. I think uh, many of us were disappointed to see the curtailment of the mortgage interest deduction and, uh, and also property tax, uh, state and local tax uh, limits uh, that were imposed in 2017. So how do we make the case that uh, tax policy for home ownership really matters and, and contributes to the public good? Well, that's a tough one. My answer to that is um, uh, there is a level of storytelling that we need to do. One of the challenges around the mortgage interest deduction is that the story to narrative became only a select few of individuals are using the mortgage interest deduction. And right now, uh, there's a study that was done that just in DC market, uh, and it's actually nationwide, but I have to speak about D.C. since we're here. Um, right now, in the D.C. proper, there's approximately 120,000 black millennials who make over $100,000 who pay more in rent than the uh, average uh, mortgage that's in this jurisdiction. And when you talk about home ownership, right, it's not that they're not mortgage ready. The biggest challenge in terms of their barrier is the down payment. And the question we have to begin to realize or ask ourselves or ask policymakers, we know that there are, just here in Washington, D.C., right? I think in, at national level, it's like 1.7 million black millennials who make $100,000 who pay more in rent than the mortgage that they live in, who are ready to be homeowners. But their biggest gap is the down payment. If we can solve that, or create a policy that addresses that, how the federal government working with the state and working down to the local level, how we can address that, we can get a lot more homeowners into homes in the places that they wanna live. So a couple of things, just to talk about the mortgage interest deduction for a minute. For those of us who have you know, worked with low and moderate income populations for a long time, that's never really been a factor because they weren't itemizers. Right. Um, I've always supported uh, changing the structure of that into a refundable credit so it could have helped people, given what we've now done with tax reform, this is almost a non-issue. And, and the question is, you know, how, we have to demonstrate a few things. First, um, going back to what I was talking about, about neighborhoods, about communities, is home ownership is, definitely about the individual and definitely about building family wealth and prosperity. It is also about building collective wealth and prosperity and lifting everyone up together, including everybody in the neighborhood and including the amenities in the neighborhood and the schools and the kids. All of this is tied together and it's either a downward spiral together or it's a virtuous cycle up together. Um, and so it, since tax policy, for better or worse, is one of the leading instruments of social policy in this country, we have to make sure it's supporting what we want it to support, which isn't just, um, you know, homes for the wealthier among us, though I am 
not opposed to homes for the, I think it's, I, I'm, I'm for home ownership for as many people who can attain it in a sustainable and safe way. Um, but it's, it's really about uh, broadly looking at the different components of the program and putting that subsidy where you need to put that subsidy, which isn't necessarily just in an individual tax credit. Mm -hmm. I, I think you can get uh, you know, as much lift through some of the leveraging um, mechanisms that we've talked about today as you can through that. But you know, to, to further respond to you, home ownership has a reputational uh, issue to overcome in a lot of neighborhoods that we work in, particularly neighborhoods of color, um, neighborhoods that were very scarred by the foreclosure crisis. The lending community has, has to continue to rebuild trust. We have to make sure the rules that govern lending continue to sit, stay strong, even as we're more than a decade out from the crisis. Um, and we have to really educate communities for, you know, all the folks, who, many of the folks who think they can't get together a down payment, it's because they think they need a 20% down payment. And they don't know about all the range of programs out there, whether it's an FHA or a, you know, Fannie or Freddie loan, down payment loan, or whether it's just the many forms of down payment assistance that are out there through state agencies and, you know, through many other providers. Um, of this type of assistance. So, you know, I think that's where everyone in this room is really partnering and focused right now so that we can uh, raise these issues up in public awareness. Stockton, we have less than a minute, but uh, what's, what are your words of wisdom on this briefly? Well, well maybe just to tie back this conversation uh, to some of what uh, was discussed earlier. And, um, and to maybe make a connection between rental housing policy and home ownership, uh, you know, what FHFA has begun doing, the big moves to get Fannie and Freddie, you know, ready to leave conservatorship, whether it's the capital rule, which is coming back uh, uh, soon, or the creation and establishment of the uniform mortgage-backed security, or these, these big picture financial regulatory exercises, just keep an eye on how the ripple effects uh, will impact the ability of state and local housing finance agencies, nonprofit organizations, uh, motivated private sector developers, realtors, and others to make affordable home ownership and rental housing possible. Sometimes you got to go to the second or third layer. We're spending a lot of time uh, to try to document and show what these effects are, and we get it. Um, there are big priorities at stake in the restructuring of Fannie and Freddie under FHFA's watch, uh, and much of it is going in a very positive direction. Uh, but there is going to be collateral, perhaps unintended impact on housing affordability as these big moves continue to be made. And I would just encourage everyone to be paying close attention to how those play out. Well, thank you. And I invite the audience to thank our great panel for a great <laughs> conversation. All right, well, thank you to our great panelists. That was a robust discussion on uh, ways that we can increase access to mortgage credit, as well as the importance of tax incentives for housing. It's up to all of us to make sure that we continue to do our jobs to educate the consumers and the public in general, um, so that we can make sure that we rise the bar, uh, the raise the level of home ownership within our communities. So now let's take a 15 minute break and please be back in your seats by three o'clock so that we can continue with our conversation and discuss research on the social and economic benefits of home ownership and the importance of restoring tax incentives for home ownership into the U.S. tax code. We'll see you at three o'clock.